Hello everybody and welcome back to episode 8 of my video series in which we program an entire video game from scratch from beginning to end using the C programming language. So let's go ahead and get started. Let me fire up Visual Studio, load our project. I don't think I got any interesting questions since last time. Uh, but I did have an interesting discussion where uh, apparently a lot of people don't like my double spacing. Uh, for example, they are used to seeing everything single spaced like this and like this. Needless to say, it's um, completely up to you. It's a preference. Um, and I used to program like this. Uh, I used to, to be a single spacer as well. But over time, I've come to actually prefer uh, double spacing pretty much everywhere. And I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or what, but um, I find that it, it helps me uh, find things whenever they're double spaced. Uh, a lot of times when things are real cramped, when all the lines are cramped together, um, it's easy for me to gloss over things and miss things. So I prefer I prefer my double spacing, and I don't know why I just did that. I like to double I like to uh, line up my equal signs too sometimes, but there's also a point where it looks silly, like this much space between the equal sign little silly so I'm just gonna leave it as it as it was okay so now where were we I believe last time we left off where we had finally achieved our dream of stretching the back buffer and the window both all the way across the monitor and then we we proceeded to then draw some pixels into that back buffer and blip them onto the screen uh, let's go ahead and just, yeah, here we go. We're, here's where we drew our blue pixels. Let me go ahead and run this and see what happens. Okay, now what happens is we get a blue screen here, but as you can see, if you look really closely, there is a, there is a white border all the way around. There's like a one pixel or maybe two pixel wide uh, border going all the way around and that is not what I wanted and I don't like that so the first thing I'm gonna do is go and fix that and if I go back up here to my create main game window function uh, where I first created the window it's either in the window class um, there's no window class style um, Ah, here it is. In the create window ex function, uh, for this first parameter, it looks like the first parameter is uh, dw ex style, and uh, ex so it's an extended style. And for some reason, there is an extended style in here of ws ex client edge. So this window gets created with a client edge extended window style. And um, I don't know why. I think it probably is probably because we copied this off of the internet, off of somebody's code. Um, but we don't want this extended window style. So we are just going to replace that with a zero. And I'm going to try it again. All right. Now it looks perfect. It's uh, pixel perfect. Uh, completely stretches all the way across the monitor. Uh, has no borders or anything like this. It's exactly the size of the monitor, which is precisely what we wanted. All right, let's go down to let's go back down to where we make our pixels. First of all, that that full blue is a little bit um, bright for me, so I'm going to darken it a bit. Let's probably make it like a dark blue. Yeah, it makes it a little bit darker easier on my eyes. So this part, um, if I remember correctly, this part, I was just playing around with this uh, for loop and 
Um, I, know, I remember I made the game crash a couple of times using this for loop, and I also noticed that, that the audio of my recording went all crazy whenever uh, around this time. And I don't know if the two events are related, uh, the game crashing and my audio in OBS also going pear-shaped, but it seems like they might be. So I'm going to try not to crash the game anymore, though I can't make any promises because... Um, Oh yeah, who am I lying to? Uh, this game is going to crash a lot more by, by the time we're done with it. But anyway, I wanted to um, re-explain this a little bit because even though this isn't permanent code, this is just playing around test code. Um, I never really got around to explaining it, and it's pretty. It's a pretty important concept. Um, I think this is the first for loop that we have used so far in this game, and if you're not familiar. Um, obviously a for loop we're just saying um, for every iteration of this loop I want you to execute whatever is inside the loop which is that mem copy uh, expression right there and what I'm saying is I want this X this is going to be my counter uh, variable for controlling how many times we run through here uh, run through this loop uh, so um, integer x is going to start at 0, and the loop is going to continue running until, uh, or I'm sorry, as long as x is less than resolution width times resolution height. And for every iteration through the loop, we are going to increment x by 1. So I think the last time I crashed my game by by doing this number right here uh, game drawing area memory size and this crashed because game drawing area memory size is uh, our resolution which is 384 by 240 times our bits per pixel which is 4 so 380 by uh, 384 by 240 by 4 is actually more pixels than we actually have in our back buffer uh, because we fire up some PowerShell and if we do 384 pixels wide by where is my asterisk there it is by 240 pixels high so we have 92,160 pixels total we can never draw more than 92,160 pixels uh, because then it will go off the edge of the back buffer, it will go beyond the bounds of our memory, and it will crash. So that's why that was crashing. So what I actually needed to do was uh, basically width times height. Now the reason why this uh, the reason why it knows to go in basically uh, four bytes at a time is all down to this magic right here um, casting it to a pointer to a pixel 32 so by casting it to this uh, pointer to a pixel 32 data structure uh, the compiler knows that this thing is four uh, four pixels wide so for example, um, x is going to be like, for, think about the first time that this loops through, x is going to be 0. So it's just going to write the first pixel right at the very first, right at the very beginning of gbackbuffer.memory. But then when x on the next iteration through the loop, x should be 1, correct? x plus plus is our iteration so every time we go through the loop we're iterating x by one so on the next run through it's going to copy it to memory plus one well what does that mean one how does it know that it's that we're copying uh, that plus one actually means four bytes uh, forward that we're actually advancing four bytes every time and it's because of it's because of this cast right here and if we take it away you'll see that the compiler, it won't even compile. The compiler will not compile it at all. It has to know exactly what it says. The error says must be a pointer to a complete object type. So I'm going to put it back with 
Control Z, I think. There we go. So that is that is that. So I noticed something interesting also while I'm just sitting here um, that I'm just using memcopy, and I think that the compiler is supposed to be warning me right now and telling me to use memcopy underscore s. Remember, isn't the compiler supposed to be warning me to use the more uh, the safer versions of these functions? Why is it not warning me? That's what I don't understand. I'm going to take off that S right there. I'm going to rebuild. If I go back up to here and completely take that out, uh, where I say where I temporarily move the warning level down to three while I include windows.h and if you recall in our project properties we have all warnings enabled so there should not be an issue here uh, C++ enable all warnings all configs all platforms my rebuild bunch of warnings but no errors okay let me put these back let me go back down here and unfortunately since the compiler for some reason is not warning me to use the secure version of this function even though I know I should I'm gonna go ahead and use the secure function so all it is is basically I have to specify a buffer size. So it is destination size. Okay, our, well we know our, de our destination size. We're only writing four pixels at a time, right? See what happens if I do that. Okay, will it run? Yes, it runs fine, so I assume that that is correct. And all right, so we're just gonna leave that like it is for right now. Okay, so the next thing I want to um, address, the next thing I want to address is I want to also notice that, see my, my other warnings went away suddenly. I'm telling you, Visual Studio has some strong points, but it also has a lot of idiosyncrasies. Really annoys me. There, now my warnings are back. Okay, so I believe I want to get rid of these warnings. Um, go ahead and get rid of them once and for all. So, this warning right here says game bitmap four bytes padding added after data member bitmap info. So, remember game bitmap, that's the data structure that we created ourselves and it's telling us that it added some padding after bitmap info so right here it added some padding it added four bytes of padding four bytes of padding the question is why did it do that and to answer that question first I would like to know well how big is bitmap info so I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to any random place in the code and just run to cursor and right there uh, in my watch window, a size of bitmap info is 44 bytes. So I'm going to stop. So I'm going to say this is 44 bytes. That is the size of a bitmap info data structure. And then a, a void star, uh, which is it's a pointer to a memory address. And since this is a 64-bit machine, uh, that is going to be 8 bytes. If this were a 32-bit machine, that would be 4 bytes, but here it's 8 bytes. So that gives us a total of uh, 52 bytes. So we have this data structure, and we've given it 50, we've written, uh, it contains 52 bytes. Uh, so why does the compiler feel like it needs to add an extra 4 bytes to it? Uh, well, the answer is um, quite simple. The answer is that in pretty much all of uh, you know today's 
computer architectures, and I think this has been true for many, many, many decades, uh, longer than, I'm, than I've been alive probably, uh, computers like this like to process information that is aligned on specific memory boundaries. It likes to do everything by the native word size of the machine or factors thereof. Uh, so for example, or long story short, basically your structure needs to be a factor of pointer size in order to be perfectly aligned, in order to stay perfectly aligned. So uh, let me look at PowerShell again. Um, our data structure, our 52 data, our 52 byte data structure uh, divided by 8 is 6.5. 6.5 means that it is not a factor of 8. So if the compiler adds 4 bytes to our data structure so that now our data structure is 56 bytes, now it is a smooth aligned factor of 8. 8 because 8 times 7 is 56. So that's why the compiler does it. So what I mean by the compiler likes it uh, if data structure or the computer quote unquote likes it if data structures are an even you know factor of eight is um, efficiency processing efficiency and the speed with which the CPU can share data or fetch data from memory so if you don't align your data structures you will incur a performance penalty so if the compiler did not add these padding bytes into my data structure then it could potentially cause a performance penalty when we use uh, this data structure that may or may not be that important depending on how many CPU cycles you're trying to uh, squeeze out of your program uh, you know, if you're trying to make it as fast as possible, then uh, padding becomes important to you. Um, the next question is, well, when would you ever not want to pad, uh, pad, pad your data structure? Um, basically just size. So if you're working on an embedded machine, uh, an, a system on a chip, or like some sort of embedded circuitry where you have like 48 kilobytes of RAM, for example, in that case, you may actually want to you may actually want to not pad your structure, uh, and you can you can tell the compiler um, to to not add padding bytes by using uh, this Pragma uh, pack uh, precompiler definition, I guess you would call it. So uh, we are not going to use that because we want the padding bytes because we want it to be we want. We want this uh, this um, data access to be as fast as possible. We want it to be aligned on memory boundaries, and we don't really care. Like we're not hurting for memory. This PC has 16 gigabytes of RAM on it, so uh, an extra four bytes uh, doesn't hurt me at all. So yeah, so I'll just let it do it. And not only that, but I don't actually, now that we have the behavior explained, which I believe I have explained it adequately, now we no longer care about the warning. So I can probably disable it with this. Um, pragma, warning, disable, uh, 4820. See how the... Uh, the error code is 4820 so I can tell the, the compiler just don't don't warn me about padding my data structures because I understand why you do it and now I, I no longer care so I, you don't have to tell me about those so now that one is gone that error or actually warning is completely gone so this one this next warning compiler will insert specter mitigation for memory load if slash Q specter switch specified well, this one annoys me because the whole um, Spectre memory uh, vulnerability came out in, was it 2018 or 2019? I don't remember. I think it was 2018. So this is a whole class of uh, vulnerabilities that, um, 
were made, were tied to the way that Intel processors mostly utilize what's called speculative execution. And um, you know what? I don't even want to go into that, and I probably couldn't even explain it that well if I did. So uh, suffice it to say, it's regard it, it's related to a class of exploits that are pretty new, and they're pretty uh, they're pretty much, as far as I'm aware. Um, specific to Intel processors. Uh, I'm guessing Intel probably fixed this in their um, newest processors that came out in 2019 and 2020. However, all of these Intel processors that were made from like 2018 all the way back to the beginning, like all the way back to the year 2000 or something like this, are all vulnerable uh, to these exploits. So, anyway. For memory load if Q Spectre switch is enabled. I guess we'll do that. Um, I do know that the Spectre, uh, and what was the other one called? Meltdown. Spectre and Meltdown are the code names of these two computer uh, exploits. And I know that they have something to do with the way that we translate memory addresses uh, from physical memory addresses to virtual memory addresses and vice versa um, is how that exploit works and it probably has something to do with like you can exploit this in such a way that you can um, probably disclose kernel memory uh, the contents of kernel mode memory to a user mode process which is you know crossing the streams that that's definitely crossing a security boundary you should never be able to do that so um, the downside is is that I think the specter and, min and meltdown mitigations also they mitigate the issue but I think they also cause a slowdown um, I don't know if they're disabling speculative execution on the CPU or what they're doing but I know that they cause a slowdown of some sort in our game, which is just going to be like a retro style NES looking game, it's not going to matter because we're going to be able to render this thing um, at probably 10,000 frames per second anyway. So the the speed is not going to matter much to me. But if I was making some other game like, you know, you know, Call of Duty or Assassin's Creed or something, um, it could actually be a serious um, a serious hindrance to to my frames per second and to the performance of my game so anyway let's let's find this Q Spectre thing um, let's go to all options somewhere in here look for options let's look for for Q Spectre great there's nothing in here Q Spectre all options look for Q spec nothing in there either wonderful okay let's look it up on the internet window MSBC Q spec all right where do I put you that's a lot of stuff that I don't want to read There it is. Spectre mitigation. I just should have looked for the word Spectre. Um, Alright. Back up here. All options. There. Spectre mitigation. Let's turn that on. I don't know what the difference is between... Oh, there's a lot of security features. just turn that on I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because you know the point of this uh, was not to explore specter and meltdown CPU uh, vulnerabilities Oh, specter mitigated libraries are required for this project and stuff okay okay you win you win I'm not gonna install specter mitigated library so I guess they recompiled certain libraries to deal with this uh, with with this um, security vulnerability and I just can't I can't deal with it 
I'm not going to go install extra libraries. At least not right now. I might do it. I might do it some other time, but for now I'm just going to disable it. Um, this is to remind me what I disabled. Uh, disable warning about structure padding, and the next one is going to be 50, 40, 5. Disable warning about specter meltdown CPU vulnerability. Okay, finally, we are back to compiling with no warnings. I want to try one other thing though, which is to go down to, uh, I'm going back into the project properties and I'm going to go to code analysis and I'm going to automatically run code analysis every time I build the solution. Okay, and then I'm going to click on Microsoft native recommended rules and I'm going to change that to Microsoft all rules and I'm going to hit OK. Now let's see what happens. Let's see if I trigger any additional warnings from code analysis and it looks like the answer is no. So I think what that means is we are writing the most solid uh, possible code right now. Uh, that's never going to fail and is never going to produce any unexpected uh, results because we're not we're not generating any compiler warnings even when error uh, the warning levels turned all the way up and we also are not triggering any um, code analysis warnings from the static code analysis and again I'm just looking and I just saw this mem set am I, should it not be mem set underscore s should I not have been warned about the no, I guess not. I guess maybe there is no underscore s version of memset. Um, oh, let's go back down to my uh, let's go back down here to my mem co my mem copy. Comment that out. Remove that. Remove this. Now let's see if it will warn me that I'm using the unsafe version of memcopy. Nope, it doesn't. Still no warnings. Hold on. Okay. I feel like that's enough housekeeping. Uh, let's, let's keep it moving. Let's make some progress here, shall we? Oh, this is going to be this going to be a big topic this next one. Um, okay, now that we, we've got our, our back buffer going and we're drawing pixels to the screen, albeit just a solid canvas of blue pixels, we're still drawing pixels to the screen every frame. I'm curious at this point to know how many frames per second are we actually drawing? I mean, we're essentially just running, we're burning through this while loop as fast as we can processing input, we're rendering graphics, and then we sleep for one millisecond. And I put that one millisecond in quotes because we're not actually sleeping uh, for one millisecond. Um, even though it looks like this this would seem to indicate that we're sleeping for one millisecond, but it's actually not one millisecond. And I will endeavor now uh, to explain to you why that is not actually a one millisecond sleep. But first, before we do that, I just want to I just want to know how many frames per second we are actually we're actually rendering. And I think to do that, I, I feel like at this point I want to take all of our I want to take all of our our performance related data and package it or bundle it all into a single data structure. For example, things like monitor dimensions, uh, we might do like a scaling factor to help control the aspect ratio at one point. Um, I also want to do things like total frames rendered. Um, I want to do you know frames per second, maybe the last 
100 frames average or something like this. Um, I want to I want to have all of these like performance related calculations all bundled together so that I'm not sitting here making just like pages and pages of uh, global variables. I would rather have them at least categorized into uh, data structures if that makes sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new data structure and I'm going to call it uh, performance data performance data perf data naming things is the hardest part of computer science I know this for, I know this for sure for sure performance data now in here we are going to have a unsigned int 64 a 64 bit uh, which is 8 bytes wide a very large number a very large number it's like I don't even know how big it is it's like exa bytes or something huge number uh, total frames rendered total frames rendered okay and the reason why I want this to be a big number a big unsigned number basically the biggest one of the biggest unsigned numbers I can come up with on this uh, without doing some really crazy tricks is because imagine imagine if you imagine this what if I tried to what if I tried to put this into a uh, uint8 underscore t what if I did that that would mean if I increment this on every frame how big can this possibly get this data type can get up to 255 right so after 255 frames I would roll back around to zero and that would make everything completely useless. I mean, after like two seconds of my game has been running, suddenly I would no longer be able to keep track of how many frames I had rendered. So obviously, this kind of thing, you want this data, data type to be as big as it can be because the user may leave the game running. He may play the game for six hours. I mean, I don't, hopefully my game is gonna be fun enough that anybody wants to play it for six hours at, at once, but um, you know, he may be playing it for a long, long time. Uh, let's move on. Um, I also, I want to, I want to go ahead and pack my monitor width and height in there. I want to put that in there too. Oh, you know what? I want to put, hmm, hmm, yeah, hmm, I want to put all this, uh, monitor stuff in there. I want to put all of this monitor stuff into this data structure and now these no longer need to have the G prefix and it was giving me this error uh, because you can't you can't um, initialize uh, something like this. You can't initialize a data structure inside of another uh, data structure that's, you know, inside of a, a type definition. Um, yeah, you just can't do it. So we'll have to do it later. That means we'll have to initialize it at some other time. Uh, so that's fine. What else? Alright, what else? Um, we'll do a uint 32t frames per second average mm, FPS average I feel like we're probably going to want two um, values uh, we're going to want um, we're going to want to Let's do raw frames per second and cooked frames per second average. So my idea behind this is that I think we're going to have, basically, I want to know what is the raw speed that I'm getting out of this game, and I'm expecting it to probably be in the thousands, like thousands of frames per second, but 
I know that I'm going to I'm going to be artificially slowing the game down using my sleep statement because you can't play a game like a human being can't play a game at 9,000 frames per second. Uh, you have to slow it down to something like say 60 frames per second. So um, that's I'm expecting my cooked frames per second average. I'm going to try to get that to stay as close to 60 FPS as possible. Uh, now my raw frames per second average is probably going to be several thousand. At least that's that's what I'm going for. Um, okay, so now when I flip back over to my source code file, I'm going to have a lot of stuff that it needs to be fixed because I just changed a lot of variable names. Um, okay, so I get monitor info A. I'm going to store it in. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. I need to create a new variable called a performance data, and I'm going to call it G perf performance data. Okay. Hmm. 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 All right. Now I'm going to go back down here. Now. I remember that I'm going to store. I'm going to store this instead of storing it in that global um, G monitor info variable. I'm now going to store it in G performance data dot monitor info. Is where I'm going to store it. Okay. But I also remember that if I don't initialize that monitor info. Uh, data structure, then it will not work. So I need to go ahead and do that. G performance data dot monitor info equals size of monitor info. Does that not work? Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, let's just keep fixing stuff. Okay, G performance data dot monitor width. Equals Monitor height. Equals that. Equals that. I'm basically, just going along, fixing all these, all these errors since I renamed my variable. Okay, and now since that now flies way off the screen, I'm going to go ahead and put it on several different lines. That should be fine. Okay, and 
what is this last one? Expected an expression. Ah. Okay, that's still. That is still no good. Dot CB size equals. How about that? Uh, performance data redefinition. I, so it looks like I have renamed my, I have accidentally uh, named my data structure something that was some name that was already taken. So I'm going to name, going to have to rename this to game perf data. Let's try that. Game perf data. Do I like the underscore? Game perf data. You know what? I'm going to nix the underscore too. I'm not the biggest fan of underscores. All right, game perf data. All right, I've renamed my data structure. I'm going to go all the way back here. Rename this. Oops. I'm going to make this a game perf data. Now what? Rebuild. Okay, rebuild all succeeded. I'm gonna launch. Everything works perfectly. There we go. Now, back to what we were doing. At the end of each frame, I am going to g performance data dot total frames rendered plus plus. So we're going to add one. We're going to add one to that variable to total frames rendered after every frame that we've drawn. So we'll say hmm maybe I'll do a uint 16 and I'm really just kinda guessing at these data types how big they need to be you know, you don't want to make your data types bigger than they have to be, but um, you also can't make them too small. So I'm just sort of guessing at what size they need to be. Anyway, this one's going to be um, calculate uh, calculate average FPS every X frames. No, I don't like that. I don't like that. I'm going to actually just make that a pound defined. Pound defined. Calculate FPS. Calculate average FPS every X. And I'm just going to make it, I'm going to pick 100 arbitrarily. So after every 100 frames, we're going to calculate the average FPS. And we're going to make this um, if G performance data, no wait, sorry, wait, that's right. If total frames rendered, uh, mod calculate average FPS mod 100 equals 0 then I'm going to calculate my average FPS so essentially what the what the mod operator I don't we haven't seen that yet um, if you're if you're not familiar, what it means is um, you take this and you divide it by this, and the outcome is going to be the remainder of the division. So total frames rendered divided by 100, and the output of that is called is the remainder of that division. So effectively, what this means is that every multiple of 100 we are going to execute whatever is inside this if statement. Right? Because if it's if 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 the 
answer to total frames rendered divided by 100 is zero. That means that it had zero, had no remainder. It means that it was a multiple of 100. Okay, now, how much time do we have left? We have about 15 minutes left, and we are going to get into uh, Windows timing, which is one of the most fascinating topics um, that I, I, I love the concept of how uh, timing is done on Windows, uh, not because it's perfect, uh, just because it's very interesting to me. So, basically, all these computers, this computer, my computer, your computer, everybody's computer needs a timer in it, right? Your computer needs some way of understanding the concept of time. It needs to understand the passage of time. It needs to know that I am now one second or one minute or one hour later in time than I was just a moment ago, right? And we haven't dealt with that at all up until this point. One of the most interesting, um, I'm going to, I think it's called windowstimestamp.com. Um, I'm not going to read this entire website, um, but if you want to, I highly suggest it because I think that this website is really quite interesting and it actually talks a lot about um, timing in Windows and how to achieve high uh, precision and high accuracy uh, timing on Windows uh, insofar as it's possible. Um, the, the timing in Windows is, is not perfect. Um, as I've stated before, Windows is not a real-time operating system, meaning that there's I can't guarantee that any particular slice of time is going to be occupied with my code or my thread is not going to run at a particular slice of time and stop at a specific slice of time I only have to I can only get close so basically the way that that computers uh, handle the passage of time is they have a chip in them and it has a crystal oscillator in it and this crystal oscillator it's actually a little you know crystal and um, this is where basically our computers are digital but but time is an analog thing it, it it's a it's a phenomenon of the universe that is not digital it's completely uh, analog so we're basically trying to have our, our digital system being our computer understand an analog concept as well as it can. Um, so the computer has this little crystal in it that that vibrates or oscillates at uh, 32.768 kilohertz. So 32.768 uh, times per second. A thousand times per second. And now um, yeah it's just like a little crystal that, that vibrates and it changes like electrical um, signals in the chip so that the chip basically runs at 32.768 kilohertz. Now 32768, doesn't that sound familiar to you? That sounds familiar to me. Um, let's see. I'm just going to do some PowerShell. Yeah. 2 to the power of 15 is 32,768. I'm going to increase that text size to make it easier to read for you. That is uh, quite that is quite convenient to us, I think. And um, I'll try to I'll try to show you another example. Uint 16 max. Oh, sorry. Int 16 max. 32,767. So um, I think that this is not a coincidence that they chose uh, this particular value um, because I think it aligns very nicely with this 2 to the power of 15th figure, which also happens to be the max value of a 16-bit uh, integer, right? So let's see. Basically, so we have this crystal. Now, Windows 
further slices that into, um, it basically takes that signal and converts that signal into a global system timer resolution. So there is one timer resolution throughout all of Windows and you can change it, but it's a global setting. And then if you change it, it affects all the other apps on the system. And let me show you an example. If I go to um, what's it called? Clock res. It's a sys internals tool and it basically just queries the your timer frequency. So my global Windows timer frequency right now is 15.625 milliseconds. Now I think the only rationale behind that figure 15.625 milliseconds is that it just happens to be 64 times per second. 64 ticks uh, per second. So that is my current, uh, actually no, my current timer resolution is 0 0.997 milliseconds, but my uh, regular, my standard uh, timer resolution is 15.625 milliseconds. Problem is, is that an application doesn't know unless it, it queries for this timer resolution. You have to query for it first to see what it is, and then you have to base your decisions on what the current machine's uh, timer frequency is. You can try to change it, and I think we probably will um, try to change it to suit our needs, but um, I don't think it's guaranteed. Like, for example, if I, if I try to change the Windows timer resolution to one millisecond, but Windows sees that the timer resolution is already less than one second, then it might not change it at all. It'll just say, well, the timer resolution is 0.997, just deal with it. So this is going to be this is going to be a big problem for us. So let me go back to the concept of timer resolution. What this means is, um, dang, and let me back up and explain some more. When the timer fires, and let's pretend like the resolution, let's pretend like our current resolution is 15.625 milliseconds. Someone has already lowered it to this value, but let's pretend like when you first boot up Windows and no apps have requested to change it yet, it should be at this standard slow 15.625 milliseconds. The reason why is that every time this global system timer fires, then a whole bunch of stuff kicks off. The system does things like um, accounting for um, scheduling threads and it determines whether it needs to schedule another thread to run every time the every time the timer fires it needs to decide um, hey should I set this event so that this thread will wake up should I uh, keep should I keep sleeping on this thread or should this thread wake up um, it does all sorts of things like this and so the reason you would want to lower the timer resolution is that if you want it to be more uh, granular. All of those, if you want those activities to be more um, granular and have more, um, have them fire more accurately, I guess you could say. But the negative side of it is that the, the lower your timer resolution is, the more power your computer will consume. The well, yeah, that's essentially it. The more power it consumes, so. You may have heard a lot of uh, talk about certain web browsers um, consuming more battery power on laptops, and this is the precise reason. Certain laptops or certain web browsers, like let's take Chrome for example, it doesn't necessarily do this anymore, but it did do this in the past, where it would request, Chrome would request your timer resolution and set it down to one millisecond. So it would cause the uh, Windows operating system as a whole uh, to start consuming more power because remember you're doing all this context switching and thread scheduling every one millisecond now instead of every 15 milliseconds. So uh, you're doing it almost you're doing these little um, thread scheduling and context switching sorts of activities uh, 16 times as often. So it's causing you know 
a big spike in CPU usage and also in um, battery usage, in power consumption. Now, on a desktop that's wired, um, battery consumption isn't an issue, but it's worth um, keeping in mind anyway. 55 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, why, why, I don't know why mine, um, I don't know why my timer is at 0.997. Um, I may just have to deal with it. I don't know. So there are some functions. Let's go ahead and... All right. Let's go ahead and set up some timing in my game, in our little project. And we do that with, let's see, acquiring high precision time stamps in Windows. There is a really nice little article about it. It basically tells you to use uh, QPC query performance counter. All right, so to do this, um, <laughs> here we go. It's giving you all the uh, example code in here and stuff. So um, it's basically telling you how to get the uh, frequency of the uh, counter, which is static. It's it's um, you know set once at boot and never changes. So you only have to count. You only have to call uh, query performance frequency once. Um, there were older methods of accounting for time that um, really got messed up whenever, um, for example, CPUs started implementing sort of like a dynamic CPU frequency uh, 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 feature where, you know, like when your computer is idling and not doing anything, it will actually lower the, C the frequency of your CPU. And this actually upset a lot of people who were using the CPU frequency to con to to um, try to keep time, because it's like, well, if the CPU frequency is not constant, then suddenly time no longer elapses in a constant manner for me. Uh, so that was a big issue um, that luckily we don't have to deal with. Um, Windows, uh, this Windows API already makes all of these adjustments for us, and it all already does all this accounting for us. Um, but first, what I'm going to do in, in WinMain is I'm going to, where am I going to do it? I guess I'm going to do Query Performance Frequency. And I'm telling you right now, this is going to go into my game perf data, data structure. Oh, and it's a, it's a large integer, which a large integer is what? I'll show you. It's a union, but it's it's effectively like a 64-bit, unsigned 64-bit integer, I believe. Google, large integer. What are you? It's a 64-bit signed integer. And as you can see, it's a union with a low part and a high part. We haven't discussed uh, unions yet in C. Uh, we'll probably get to them later. But, I mean, it's, you know. It's an N64, okay? That's all it is. Um, large integer um, perf frequency. Okay? Now back over here, we are going to stuff that into our G performance data dot perf frequency. There. Now, what do we do next? All right, so we need at the start of the activity to be timed, we want to query performance counter, and we want to store that value in our starting time. So back over here, and that's it's a large integer too, right? Yes, everything is large integers or signed 64-bit integers. Okay, so large integer frame start, large integer frame end. OK, 
Okay, so now we remember you only have to call query performance frequency once. So now we're going to skip past all this stuff. We're going to get into our main loop. And remember, each iteration of this loop represents one frame of our game. That includes processing of player input. That includes uh, dispatching of window messages. We don't want to um, have anything going on that we aren't accounting for, right? So let's make sure we're timing it, all of this. All right, so we start query performance counter at the very beginning. And this needs to go in our G performance data dot frame start and now after we are done do I want to put it um, hmm. I think we want to put it before we sleep G performance data dot frame end. Now we need to calculate the difference between those, and that will tell us how long it took to draw this entire frame. Um, yeah, we did that part. We did that part. Now we need to do. All right. We need to make. Um, elapsed microseconds um, elapsed microseconds per frame we'll go right here okay the perf data dot elapsed microseconds per frame quad part equals end dot quad part times or minus g performance data dot frame start dot quad part okay and now we have a an a number of elapsed microseconds we need to now convert that into oh hang on so we now have the elapsed number of ticks along with the number of ticks per second. We use these values to convert the number of elapsed microseconds to guard against a loss of precision. We convert to microseconds before dividing by ticks per second. Okay. I can copy paste with the best of them. Divided by perf g performance data dot come on now dot perf now IntelliSense is going to break on me I hate you I hate you Visual Studio I hate you. Eventually, I will just memorize these variable names, but for now, I don't have them memorized. Dot quad part. There, we got it. No thanks to IntelliSense. Let's see if it compiles. It does, it compiles fine. All right, so I think that's it. Um, so let's do this. Every Every 100 frames, let's let's do this. Write debug string output debug string. I had I had problems with this the very first episode. Output debug string a, and we are going to we are going to make a temporary little buffer that is. 64 characters 
and we are going to uh, is it s print f s uh, I think it is let's just let's try f s print f Uh, there, there it is. It's S in print F, I think is what I want. Okay. We're basically going to print into that string. We are going to uh, count of str. And we are going to okay. Elapsed Where's my little micro symbol? Oh wait, never mind. It's I can't do Unicode. Never mind. I was gonna try to you do the the uh, symbol for microseconds, but I forgot I'm doing everything in ASCII, so alright, so long integer I think is enough, or maybe long long integer is enough to fit the sixty-four bit thing. Okay, and then it's going to be g performance data dot elapsed microseconds per frame. So let's see what happens. Too few arguments. Oh, str. We're going to output our string that we've created to the debugger, and we still have problems. Oh. Dot quad part because of this union part that I haven't really explained, but because it's a union, we need to put that quad dot quad part on the end there. Let's see what happens. Still errors. Yeah, <laughs> maybe unsafe. Thank you for warning me, compiler. That's very nice of you. Alright, now I need to put buffer, buffer count, max count. Uh I think I can just do truncate here. All right, now let's try. Yay. All right, now let me bring Visual Studio back up here. Let me go to output. Perfect. So every 100 frames, it's giving me the elapsed microseconds of the last frame. So you can see it's just going and going and going here. So let me hit stop. And let me, where's my output? Why is my output window not here? Windows, output, there it is. Okay, so let's take one of these as an example. What is 20? Okay. Now, since I'm an American, I'm really bad about the metric system. Um, so I'm just going to use, I'm going to cheat and use the internet. 225, 2,255 microseconds to milliseconds. Okay, so this is telling me that it took uh, 2.259 milliseconds to draw that frame which is below our target of 16.6 milliseconds so we know now that uh, that 60 FPS is going to be easily achievable for us um, I feel like honestly I feel like that's a bit slow um, but we're gonna have to figure that that out some other time because we're gonna have to figure out figure that out next time because I we're, we're out of time um, one last thing I wanted to leave you with I can't leave without saying this this sleep statement right here the reason why uh, even though I wrote I want to sleep for one millisecond that doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means because if your global system timer resolution is set to 15.625 milliseconds then one millisecond basically my thread goes to sleep and it tells it 
it tells Windows, hey, wake me up in one millisecond. Well, when that happens, and assuming that my timer, my global Windows timer resolution is set to 15 milliseconds, then Windows is going to switch in another thread and let it run, and it's going to let it run for a whole nother 15 milliseconds. And then finally, when that 15 milliseconds is up, then it will say, it will look at my thread and say, okay, you've been waiting for uh, over one millisecond now. I will wake you up and you can resume. So that is why the Windows timer resolution is going to be a big deal for us. And it's why this problem is not nearly as easy as it seems to be. Um, so getting a smooth uh, 60 FPS is going to be pretty, um, it's going to be a little, a, a bit of an interesting uh, exercise for us. So we are definitely going to resume. Um, we're going to pick up on this starting next time. So as always, uh, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter and email me and uh also, if you have any questions or comments, make sure you comment on this video and all that good stuff. And um, I will see all of you next time.